I remember when I first learned about the laws of thermodynamics and the second one always confused me because it was about entropy. The entropy of a closed system can only increase where the entropy is the messiness or disorder of a system. And I thought, how in the world did anyone come up with an equation for messiness? And why in the world would anyone come up with an equation for messiness? And how did scientists start to believe, as the singer David Byrne said from The Talking Heads, to answer these questions, we have to turn to a German scientist named Rudolf Clausius, who had this amazing ability to make almost every scientist around him think he was wrong for decades before they finally realized he's fundamentally correct. Ready for the story? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. I'd like to start in 1849 when Rudolf Clausius was a 27-year-old high school teacher. 1849 was when Clausius read a paper about the theories of heat of a long-deceased French scientist named Sadi Carnot. Clausius decided that some of Carnot's ideas were correct, but he disagreed with the idea that heat is always conserved. In 1850, Clausius published his theory that we currently believe is true, that heat can be converted into work and work into heat. Clausius wasn't the first to promote the idea of heat work equivalence, but he was the first to say that it did not require one to cast the theory of Carnot overboard, but merely the idea that no heat is lost. In addition, Clausius added a new term, which was a combination of what he called the interior work and the interior heat, that we now call the internal energy. With this term, Clausius became the first person to publish a complete version of the first law of thermodynamics, although he didn't use the word energy for a further 13 years, as the term energy was just becoming popular in the 1850s and 60s. An equation that Clausius created is still used to describe the first law with the same letters and sign conventions today. Clausius's publication made his name in science and soon he earned a job as a professor, but it also earned him some enemies. In Scotland, William Thompson, whose paper initially sparked Clausius's interest, thought that Clausius was just reiterating the work of a disheveled Scottish scientist named William Rankin and advised Rankin to send a letter to the editor to that effect. In Germany, a scientist named Hermann Helmholtz had just written a paper on the conservation of energy and felt that Clausius was just copying him. In addition, all three men decided that whatever Clausius had not plagiarized was just dead wrong. And for many, many years, Clausius could not publish anything without letters from Thompson, Rankin, or Helmholtz or more complaining about it. I tend to side with Clausius on this one. In fact, as far as I can tell, Clausius's paper of 1850 is startling in its accuracy and its importance. I'm not alone in this assessment. In 1980, a historian wrote the following. There is no doubt that Clausius, with this paper of 1850, created classical thermodynamics. All proceeding except Carnot's is of small moment. Also, all three men eventually ended up agreeing with Clausius although they always kept some disdain for the originality of his arguments or the strength of his positions. Years later, Thompson wrote, quote, the memoir of Clausius contains a most satisfactory and nearly complete working out of the theory of motive power of heat, but his hypothesis is so mixed that the general effect is lost. It probably didn't help that Thompson and Helmholtz specifically were both known for their charm and charisma and Clausius's personality has been mostly lost to time. Aside from his brother saying he was a man of rare modesty, his son writing that the most principal trait in my father's character was without doubt, the splendid truthfulness of his nature and a letter from a student years later that described Clausius as quote, that old grouch. Eventually both Helmholtz and Thompson were knighted. Helmholtz became Hermann von Helmholtz and Thompson became Lord Kelvin, like the temperature scale that is named after him. 
Despite the attacks, Clausius continued to publish his theories on heat. In 1854, Clausius published his fourth paper on heat, and this is the one where he created entropy. Well, sort of. In this paper, Clausius said that there are already two rules. The first one is the one that heat can be converted into work and work into heat. The second one was Carnot's theorem, that heat engines only work because the heat flows from the hot source to the cold sink, and the amount of heat you get is dependent on the temperature of both sources. Clausius felt, however, that Carnot's theorem in this form is incomplete because we cannot recognize therein with sufficient clearness the real nature of the theorem and its connection with the first fundamental theorem. What to do? Clausius knew that Carnot had made this hypothetical cycle where if you did it one way, heat would create work, and if you did it the other way, work would create heat. This is currently called the Carnot cycle. Clausius decided there must be some mathematical way to make two heat transformations equivalent. So if you did them in the opposite order, they would work in the opposite way. He also determined that this equivalence function had to be a function of the heat and the temperature. He also noted that less heat at lower temperatures was equivalent to more heat at higher temperatures. So the temperature must be in the denominator. He therefore decided that the function he was working with, Q over T, where Q is the heat, and T is most likely, quote, simply the absolute temperature. Clausius also defined the equivalence value of heat going from temperature one to temperature two as Q times one over T2 minus one over T1 and gave the letter N for the sum of equivalence values, which he generalized as the integral of the element of heat over temperature. Note from the present, this function, the heat over the absolute temperature, is an equation for entropy, although Clausius didn't call it entropy yet. Clausius decided that if a process was reversible, then the sum of these functions must add to zero. Here is his logic. He said, imagine it wasn't true, and the equivalence value was negative. If that was the case, then the value of the heat times one over T2 minus one over T1 would also have to be less than zero for some part of it, which means that heat would have to flow from the lower temperature to the higher temperature, which is not possible to the Carnot's theory. He then added if the sum was positive, then you do the process in reverse, and then the sum becomes negative, and once again, you get heat flowing from low temperatures to high temperatures, which is a no-no. Ergo, no matter how complicated a cycle is, if it is reversible, then the equivalent values must add to zero. Clausius added that if a process was irreversible, meaning you couldn't do it backwards, you couldn't get a negative equivalence value for the same reason, but you could get a positive one. He therefore concluded with his second law of thermodynamics, quote, the algebraic sum of all transformations occurring in a cyclical process can only be positive. By the way, I was taught that heat can't flow by itself from a cold object to a hot object because it violates the second law of thermodynamics. But in studying Clausius, I found the reverse to be true, meaning Clausius based his ideas of entropy, or what he called at the time equivalence values, on the principle that heat cannot flow from a cold object to warmer object by itself. And he got that idea from Saadi Carnot. Fast forward eight years to 1862. That's when Clausius wrote a paper about the equivalence values, cough, cough, entropy, for a system that didn't go in a full circle but started at one temperature state and ended up at another temperature state. Clausius decided that heat usually increases the mean distance between molecules, which he called the disgregation. If you've never heard that term, it's because we no longer use it, by the way. Clausius also noted that water is strange and that when ice melts, the molecules actually get closer together instead of further apart. So he added that in that case, the disgregation is not accompanied by an increase of the mean distances of the molecules. Therefore, Clausius's disgregation 
had to do with either the separation of the molecules or their orderliness. Clausius became the first to state that one could determine the entropy from the arrangement of molecules inside a body, even if you don't know how much heat it absorbed. Also, when Clausius looked at a single transformation, he realized that a general property of transformations is that a negative transformation can never occur without a simultaneous positive transformation whose equivalence value is at least as great. On the other hand, Positive transformations are not necessarily accompanied by negative transformations of equal value, but may take place in conjuncture with smaller negative transformations or even without any at all. Clausius concluded, the algebraic sum of all transformations occurring during any change of condition whatever can only be positive or as an extreme case equal to nothing. In other words, entropy of a closed system can only increase. And that's not all. Way back in 1862, some 50 years before Walther Nurse produced it, he came up with the third law of thermodynamics too, writing, quote, it may be proved to be impossible practically to arrive at the absolute zero of temperature by any alteration of the condition of a body. Three years later in 1865, Clausius published his ninth paper on heat. In this one, he said he was motivated by the desire to, quote, bring the second fundamental theorem, which is much more difficult to understand than the first, to its simplest and at the same time most general form. This paper is mostly important for the new terminology in it, because this is the paper where he renamed the equivalence value to be the shorter term entropy and gave it the letter S for no reason I can tell. We still use the letter S for entropy because of Clausius. Clausius said that he picked the term entropy from the Greek word for transformation, and he, quote, intentionally formed the word entropy so as to be as similar as possible to the word energy. Clausius then concluded with his version of the two laws of thermodynamics. One, the energy of the universe is constant, and two, the entropy of the universe tends to a maximum. Clausius's version of the two laws of thermodynamics that he wrote down in 1865 are still considered correct today. Meanwhile, William Thompson, one of Clausius's big critics, was working on his own version of the second law of thermodynamics, albeit one without an equation. Years before, in 1852, Thompson wrote that there was always a waste of mechanical energy available to man when heat is allowed to pass from one body to another at a lower temperature. By 1862, Thompson declared that the second great law of thermodynamics involves a certain principle of irreversible action in nature. It is thus shown that, although mechanical energy is indestructible, there is a universal tendency to its dissipation, which produces a gradual augmentation and diffusion of heat, cessation of motion, an exhaustion of potential energy through the material universe. With entropy, Clausius had given the irreversible action of nature an equation and a name. But wait, you say, or maybe you say, heat over temperature is not the equation I learned for entropy. That's probably because you and I we're taught Boltzmann's entropy equation. You won't be surprised to learn from its name that Clausius did not create Boltzmann's entropy equation. But you might be surprised to learn that Boltzmann didn't create it either, even though it is carved on his gravestone. So how did we get from Clausius to Boltzmann's equation? And how did Boltzmann get an equation written after him and a constant named after him that he didn't directly create? That's next time on The Lightning Tamers. If you're interested, I already have a video about the first law and I have a video about the third law. I didn't do them in order. I have a lot of videos. You should check them out. You should give me a thumbs up because it's good karma. You should share it on social media because that's even better karma. If you even want better karma than that, you can become a patron and then you'll have me thank you as I'm going to do right now. Thank you patrons, I really appreciate it. But if you're broke, you can just give me a thumbs up and a comment and tell me if I made any darn sense at all. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. The cyclical, 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 that's good. Cyclical.
cyclical. <clears throat> yeah, Hong Kong to you.